So, you've come to the conclusion that oxalate overload might be worsening your health. Therefore, the obvious solution is to immediately stop eating oxalate foods, right? In an ideal world, this might be the case. But in reality, this is what most people get wrong. Doing this too fast can make the problem worse. So, this is Elliot from EO Nutrition. And in today's video, we're going to go over how to start a low oxalate diet the right way. Today, you're going to learn what is a low oxalate diet and who might benefit. Why the low oxalate diet might be the only way to know if there's a problem. What is oxalate dumping? The essential starting point and where to find an accurate oxalate food list. And finally, how much oxalate to reduce over time. First things first, what is a low oxalate diet? A low oxalate diet involves eating foods with a maximum of 50 milligrams of oxalate per day. And just to give you some perspective, here is a list of commonly eaten foods and their oxalate contents. As you can see, it can be very easy to surpass the 50 milligram mark. In fact, many people eat 10 to 20 times this amount every single day. And who can potentially benefit from this diet? There are actually a wide range of health problems in those people with oxalate overload. Anyone with any of the symptoms I mentioned in this video, which might range from pain of any kind, neuropathy, kidney or bladder issues, gut issues or calcifications. The next question is, why can starting a low oxalate diet sometimes be the only way that someone might find out that they actually have a problem with this? Well, from the available evidence, it seems as though the body has two modes, so to speak. When the blood level of oxalate is consistently high, either because of incoming levels through the diet, increased absorption, or the liver is making too much of its own, the body will retain oxalate in tissue. Now, this might actually be a way for the body to protect the kidneys since a high oxalate load can cause kidney failure and death in some cases. It also seems as though someone can be asymptomatic while this is happening, and this can go on for years or decades. In contrast, the body can enter into a second mode where it begins to excrete stored oxalate from its tissue. This only occurs after the body senses a drop in blood oxalate level below a certain threshold. Oxalate is then dumped from the tissue into the blood, and this temporarily pumps up the blood level once again. This process is also known as oxalate dumping. So if someone's blood level stays consistently high, they're not necessarily going to even know that they've got a problem. Another key point to drill down here is that oxalate is not metabolized or changed in any way. It's not detoxified. It's dumped as is into the blood. It can then exit the body through the eyes, the skin, lungs, kidney, and the intestine. And because of its irritant properties, on its way out, it can trigger symptoms in any of those regions of the body. Likewise, it's detected as a poison by the immune system and activates the inflammatory response, which can lead to mild systemic inflammation. And it's only after the blood level decreases that the body can start getting rid of what's been stored. And this is exactly what we're trying to achieve with a low oxalate diet. An excretion appears to be cyclic, meaning that it comes and goes and might only occur every few weeks. As you can see from these graphs, it can potentially occur over the span of many years. This has been shown in the research on genetic hyperoxaluria, where researchers showed that stored oxalate resolubilizes and is released into the blood. So the most important point to understand, and which most people get wrong, is this. The faster you reduce oxalate, the faster the rate of excretion from the body. And going too fast is not a good thing. Reducing oxalate too quickly can be dangerous because the amount that you dump overwhelms the body's ability to excrete it. It can actually cause more damage in the long run and for this reason is not advised. This is probably one of the reasons why some people starting the carnivore diet feel terrible feel like they're going through hell. The key to doing this successfully is to go slowly and gradually. So the essential starting point is to get a rough idea of how much oxalate you actually consume. The problem is that there's lots of conflicting information online, for instance, that tell you coffee is high when coffee is actually low. The key is to find an accurate list. For this, you have a few options. First, you can find the TLO group on Facebook and follow the instructions to obtain the detailed list. Unfortunately, I can't share this publicly for legal reasons, but if you're not part of that group, you would do very well to join it. Alternatively, you can use the Oxalate calculator on MarrickDoyle.com. As you can see, all you need to do is add in a food like spinach with the quantity and you can see that it tells you how much you're getting. If we do the same for sweet potato, it tallies up both the ingredients. Now you'll notice here that oxalate level is reported in total and soluble levels. Some may say different, but my strategy is the same as on the TLO group, which is to calculate how much oxalate is consumed by looking at the total number, 
not the soluble number. You can also find a simplified list on Susan Owen's website, lowoxalate.info. All you do is click on the recipes and food lists, and there you can see a categorized chart with foods. It doesn't specify exactly how much in milligrams, but you can see the chart, which gives a rough idea of the classification. So here is an example of some high to extremely high foods. One thing to note is that the variety or even the ripeness of a plant food can change the oxalate content. So some varieties might be high, whilst other varieties of some plants might also be on the moderate or low part of the list. Here are also some examples of moderate to low foods. So when you've got a rough idea of how much you're actually eating, the first thing to focus on is to gradually remove those extremely high, very high, and high foods. So the simplified way of doing this is to go by portion sizes. You find the really high foods and you reduce one food by one quarter or one half per week. Now, this is an easy way, but it's not very precise. Another slightly more complicated way of doing this is by reducing by about 100 milligrams per week. For this, let's say that you calculate your intake is around 800 milligrams per day, and this is mostly coming from four foods. You would reduce the amount that you're eating of one of those foods to equal about 100 milligrams of oxalate per week. So week one, you would reduce chocolate intake. This would leave you with about 700 milligrams per day. You then stop the chocolate the following week. Same thing for almonds, then sweet potato, then Swiss chard. The idea is then by week eight, you would not be eating any of the foods which fall under that extremely high, very high or high category. Furthermore, once you're doing this, you will be gradually increasing your intake of low oxalate foods or ideally animal foods. From that point onwards, you then gradually remove the foods which fall under the moderate oxalate category. And remember, the ultimate aim is to get to approximately 50 milligrams of oxalate per day. But bear in mind, this might be way too fast for some people. In fact, those on a really high, high oxalate diet, say above 1,000 milligrams per day, they're going to probably need to reduce that by about 5 to 10% every single week. A simple way to do this is take an average that you consume per day, for example, 1,500 milligrams. You find 5% of that, and then you also find 10% of that. Now you do a similar thing as before, but basically you're reducing it much more slowly. Let's say you reduce it by 5% per day, you need to calculate exactly how much food that actually is. Doing it this way is gonna be more appropriate for the people who've been on a very high oxalate diet, or alternatively, their symptoms are severe. However, doing this approach can take more than six months to get to the achieved level of oxalate, which is 50 milligrams per day, and it takes a lot more work. So to summarize, you need to get a rough idea of how much you eat per week. From then on, you can either reduce it via portion sizes or alternatively, and the advised way is to do a calculation of exactly how much you're having and reduce that by a certain percentage. It could be 100 milligrams every week. Alternatively, for most people, it's probably gonna be between five and 10%. For those eating a tremendous amount of oxalate every day, it could take up to six months or a year to get to 50 milligrams, which is a low oxalate diet. One thing to remember is that there is no rush. Faster is not better when it comes to oxalates, and the best way to do it is gradually, slowly, and in line with how your body is feeling. Another thing is, is that you will likely experience dumping symptoms. This generally is gonna happen when oxalate level is reduced, when the blood level becomes lower and the body starts getting rid of what it's been stored. So some people, they dump very quickly. Other people, it can take them sometimes months or even a year to begin dumping. Fortunately, in the next video, we're gonna look at exactly how you can manage this using specific supplements and nutrients and food timing in a correct way.